Oh, you can be seated. Listen, isn't it a great opportunity to be in the house of God tonight? Um, so honored to be with you, excited for what God has put in my heart to share with you. Um, just a couple of quick things. Obviously, you guys are familiar with these first Wednesdays, and, and the same thing. I mean, it, we get up here, and the typical thing is a pastor is going to come up and say some nice things about your pastors, but, but I can honestly speak from a real place, just as you were saying, that you and Pastor Tiffany, they, you guys mean so much to us, and we have, we have talked through a multiplicity of things. You guys have been an inspiration to us. I was telling Pastor Elliot today, I'm like, dude, I lost 40 pounds because of you. I saw him working out. I'm like, man, I got I to gotta get, 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 get my game right. And, uh, but, but I think when I think about you and Pastor Tiffany, I think about health. I think about capacity that you guys are some of the most healthy leaders I know. You inspire me to be healthy and my wife. And I really sense as I was driving up here, the capacity that God has given you is, it's great. And what God is building here is supernatural. And, and the capacity is great because the humility is great. Both you and Pastor Tiffany, you guys really love Jesus. You really want to see his glory reflected in the earth. You really want to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And you guys display that in your family and you display that in this house. You display that privately. So I just want to honor you and say thank you for your integrity. Thank you for being the real deal. You took my words, man. You take my words. Thank you for being the real deal. And, and I'm saying this from a, a, a real place. And so I just want to tell you and Pastor Tiffany how much we love you. We honor you. You know, sometimes honor, it's not so much for the one receiving it, but the one giving it. It keeps our hearts grateful. It keeps a sense of gratitude within our hearts. So can we thank God for your pastors tonight? Oh, come on, Lifeline Church. Let's go. Love you so much. Well, listen, uh, I bring greetings from my family, uh, my beautiful wife and daughters. You may be thinking, how in the world did she marry that guy? Fasting and prayer. So if you are single in the house tonight, you want to know the secret. She's way out of my league, but a lot of fasting, a lot of prayer. I would have married her right off the gate. Took her about a year to, to see me. And, uh, but God is kind and he is faithful. I have three beautiful girls. Uh, let me see, 12, 10, and 7. Uh, it's my retirement plan, and uh, we're doing good so far. No, I'm just kidding. I uh, love my girls, and uh, they were going to be here tonight, but I had to leave so early because of traffic, so they still have school, um, but they bring their greetings and uh, excited to, to be with you. Now, my, my assignment tonight is to give you the Word of God. Are you guys ready for the Word? Yeah. And I, I really believe that it's going to, it's not going to be anything new. I'm not going to wow you tonight. I, I'm really here just to reinforce what God is already doing in and through you in this house and I want to open up with Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And this is what it says. It, Jesus makes it very clear to go, therefore, into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, Jesus said, and know or lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. I want to speak to you uh, around this idea tonight of let's go. Let's go. Now, now this, is, this is kind of a, uh, it, it can be kind of a, a slang term where, where some people can use it when they're excited, like, let's go. Some of you guys may be on the way to church, you're running a little bit late, and you're like, let's go. And then, then others of us, we, we can use it in this sense where you're just, oh, you're just so pumped. Let's go. Let's, look at your neighbor and say, let's go. That's all I got. Let's go and make disciples of all nations. Would you pray with me? Hey, big welcome to everybody joining us online. And if you're here for the first time, welcome home. Grateful that you're here. Father, in Jesus' name, as we open up your word, I pray that you would speak clearly to us. Lord, I, I pray that it would not be with wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of your spirit's power. God, I thank you for your presence in this house. Lord, I thank you that as a vine continues for generation after generation bearing fruit, that that is Lifeline Church. Lord, I'm reminded of the moment when you were at the wedding and the, the wine ran out. And then you did a miracle. You brought new wine. And there was something in that moment, God. 
or the bridegroom of that party said, this wine is great. Normally the choice wine is brought out first, but you have saved the best for last. And I just believe prophetically over this house that Lord, what you have done in the past has been extraordinary. And we honor you and we thank God for it. But we know that the latter is going to be greater. That Lord, you have saved the best for last. And so Lord, we look to you tonight and we, we need you. We need a move of your spirit in our lives and in this great city. And so, Lord, I pray that you would supernaturally equip us tonight with a fresh heart and vision for your name, for your kingdom, for your fame, and for your glory, and for our good. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So I, I want to I let's go way back. I want to take you back to the 1800s. In the 1800s, there was a guy by the name of General George McCollum. Maybe you've heard of him. He was one of the greatest military minds to, to grace our nation. Uh, in fact, it was General George McCollin that was hired by Abraham Lincoln, and they called him a young Napoleon. They, he was the youngest, one of the youngest to graduate West Point, and he had this ability to recruit. In 1861, in just four months, he grew the Union Army by 300%. Come on, that is, that is one awesome growth track. That is one awesome growth track. If you haven't jumped into growth track, you need to jump into growth track. But, but the union kind of fell into a slump. Morale was down. And now here they are outnumbering the Confederate, Confederate army two to one. Now, General George McCollin, one of the brilliant, most brilliant military minds on the face of the planet, one of the greatest generals. But, but there was this problem with General George McCollin. And that was this, is that was he, he would never engage in the fight. He would plan, he would strategize, but it was never a good time. You remember Top Gun? And it's not good, no goose. It's, not, it's, it's no good, it's no right. He, it was just never a good time to engage in the fight. In fact, Abraham Lincoln had a moment where General, uh, General Lee of the Confederate Army was, was it within striking distance. And rather than moving forward, General George McClellan said, it, it's not a good time. Now, how many of you guys know Abraham Lincoln not only hired the greatest military mind to walk the face of the planet, but he also fired the greatest military mind to grace our nation. And he hired a guy that would go to war in flip-flops, and his name was Ulysses S. Grant. And what, what's, what's really interesting, what's really interesting is this, is that it can seem very odd for a general who has a brilliant mind yet not engage in the fight. It's a lot like a follower of Jesus that we can spend time reading, praying, preparing, yet never going and making disciples. A couple of things that I've learned over the years is that the moment you say yes to Jesus is the moment you say yes to making disciples. Now, again, if you're a first time guest or maybe you're joining us online, I want to say welcome home. Believe God has something for you tonight. But, but for a lot of us, if we're not careful, we can think that making disciples is up to the pastors. It's up to the missionaries to really do the work. But what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, he says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints. That's our job as pastors is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So can I just tell you, the moment you said yes, to Jesus is the moment you said yes to making disciples. Let me tell you what else I know. What else I know is this, is that we all know someone who was far from God and needs to be closer. So there, there may be even people right now that you know are far from God. And the Holy Spirit is going to bring them to your mind. Even as I'm speaking, they're going through your head right now. Yep, her, him, even them. And, and, and what I also know in regards to this is that, that you are God's plan to reach them. Not change them, because that's the Holy Spirit's job, but to reach them. We, we plant, we water, but God brings the increase. Now, I don't know, uh, actually, I, wanna, I don't want to say I don't know if you know, because I know you know, is that the local church is God's plan A to reach the world. There's no plan B. And I think when it comes to making disciples, sometimes we, we can make it a little bit complex. Now, maybe you're sitting here like, oh, man, I, I was hoping this was going to be a message for me. Can I just tell you this is a message for you? So lean in. I think sometimes we make discipleship a little bit complex, don't we? 
I, I like to boil it down to, to two simple things. Number one is just doing life with an eternal perspective. Doing life with an eternal perspective. It, in other words, if, if you're going to go to the gym or you're, you're out and about at work, just go to work, go to the gym, go to school, but just do it with an eternal perspective in mind. Ask the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to help you see through the lens of eternity. It changes everything. But what I also know is this, is that discipleship is simply identifying where somebody is spiritually and helping them take one step. Look at your neighbor and say, one step. And so, so it, it's basically if someone has been saved and hey, uh, or if they don't know Jesus, let's get them saved. If they know Jesus, man, let's get them baptized. If they've, they're saved and been baptized, man, let's, let's, let's get them into a Bible reading plan. Let's start some spiritual formation. Let's get them into growth track. Let's get them in a small group. And so, so, so you, you know that very well and clear here at Lifeline Church. Can I get a yes and an amen? Yes. amen. But, but some of you, you're like, I know this. As a matter of fact, some of you could probably preach this better than I can. Like, man, I should have stayed at home on this Wednesday night. But, but maybe God wants to, to, to put a fresh fire in you tonight. Others of you, when you think about making disciples, maybe you feel a little inadequate. Like, man, I'm, I'm kind of new to faith. I only walk with Jesus for a while. Maybe I'm a little afraid. I don't want to mess things up. I'm not a theologian yet, but if you stay here at Lifeline Church, you will become a theologian. And, and so, so some of you guys are just killing it. You invite so many people to church. You're, you're invested 100%. You're all in. Can I just tell you, keep killing it. But, but I think for many of us, when we hear, even those, that, those of us that love Jesus, when we hear about making disciples, a lot of times we think about our schedule and it can feel exhausting. Go and make disciples? Really, bro? Another thing on my plate. Like I'm already working 70 hours a week, commuting in traffic. Oh, you want to talk about making disciples? How about you come nanny my, my kids, work my two jobs, and then we can, you know, talk about making disciples. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe not that way, but you ever, you ever felt just a, a little exhausted? Like it just feels like another task. Man, my, my, my limit already feels, my capacity already feels like I'm at limits in a lot of different areas. And, but, but I would argue that Jesus invites us to go a little bit differently than that. I, I love what he says here. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, do you find it odd, like I find it odd, that Jesus is talking about rest, but he's using an illustration of a tool for work? Because in a, a yoke was what was placed, uh, the, this wood contraption that's placed on two oxen to go work and plow the field. So Jesus, you're, you're talking about rest, but you're using an illustration for work. Huh. A lot of times we think about rest, we're like, give me a vacation. Get me out of Lodi for a season. I want to go to the desert and play golf. Maybe you want to go to Hawaii. Maybe just need a break. But one of the things that I love about Jesus is he's not giving us an escape from life. He's not giving us an escape from reality, an escape from pressure, an escape from trouble, an escape from persecution. He's saying, no, 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 I'm going to give you a brand new way to carry life. And that is life with me. So Jesus would say this, don't go with great exhaustion. Jesus would say something like this, let's go with great rest. I haven't called you to go and make disciples with great anxiety, great guilt, great burnout, try to perform and strive to get the next person. No, no, he said, I, I want you to go and make disciples with me. I, I want to do this with you. There's nothing more exhausting than trying to do the work of God without him. And so, so he wants you to do it with him. And it's so much better that way. You know, one of the things that I, I've, I've come to understand is that when it comes to this journey with God, there, there's a couple things that, that really, really matter. You, want, you ready for those? Are you, are you tracking with me? So th this is it. What, when, we are, when we're going to enjoy the journey, if we're going to enjoy the journey, a lot of times it depends on who we're with and what we're holding on to. Who we're with and what we're holding on to. So my wife and I, we uh, traveled down to Bakersfield for a conference several years back. 
And uh, we were on this beautiful, beautiful highway called Highway 5. And uh, <laughs> you guys know, like, that is a lie. Um, on this beautiful journey down Highway 5. And can I just tell you, we got there so fast. Because I was with my wife, and we were holding great conversation. But then we're getting ready to leave the conference. We're tired. We get into an argument. Anybody been there? And the ride home was the longest ride ever. Why? Because I disconnected from my wife. I was no longer with her on the ride home. And I decided to hold on to a grudge. And so we finally make up when we're almost home. We're like at the Altamont. And we finally, uh, three hours later, four hours later, we're, we're making up. And I looked at her and I said, man, babe, was that not the longest ride? I felt like we were coming from L.A. And she was like, oh, it did. And it's still your fault. And I was like, <laughs> fair game, fair game. But, but a lot of it depends on, on, on who you're with and what you're holding on to. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go with me. And I want you to hold on to a few things on the journey. If you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down. The first thing that he wants us to hold on to is number one, his grace, his grace. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's holding a staff meeting in Galilee. And the disciples, they saw some incredible stuff up to this moment. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him raise the dead. They saw the demon possessed, freed. But then Jesus dies and they're bummed. They're like, oh man, we, we had hoped he was the one. They were bummed. Then he raises from the dead. They're excited again. So it's kind of like this. Ah, oh, yes. Like now's the time. Let's go take Rome. This is our hour. And then Jesus says, yeah, not, not so fast. He says, I'm actually going to ascend to the Father. And now you are my plan. So you could get it from the disciples. They, they kind of had the moment where they were, they were down and then they were up and then they were down again because the Lord said, no, 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 you are my plan. Matthew 28, verse 16 says it this way. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted, some doubted. So, so here they are staring at the risen king and some are like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And that's what I love about the scripture is you can't fabricate it. The scripture is, it's, it's so pure in its form. If you were trying to make up a story, you would not give examples like this. You, you would leave that out of the story. But Matthew was so honest here. You see the humanity of the disciples. You see the struggle of the disciples. You see the issue of the disciples. They're wrestling through life. And you also see a great picture of God's patience. But this is what I want you to see is, is both the worshipers and the doubters. He doesn't even address them. He doesn't address the doubters at all. He sends the worshipers and the doubters on the same mission. And he tells them, listen, I know you got some stuff going on. And I know you're messed up in a few ways and you're struggling through some stuff, but, but we have work to do. He doesn't even address them. He sends them on the same mission. And for some of us today, you might be in that space where you're struggling through some things. You're, you're going through some stuff. So you're like, I just don't know if I'm ready. Can I just tell you, God has still called you. God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for direction. And as long as we're moving closer to him and allowing him to shape and to form us, can I just tell you, God still calls you to be a part of the story. But it's his grace. You know, uh, there, was, there was a time where I was getting ready to pick up my coach from the airport. Now, two things that all pastors need, counseling and coaching. And I was getting ready to pick up my coach from the airport. Did not want to be late. I'm on 98th in Oakland, getting ready to, to go to the airport. I'm at Starbucks. So I sensed the Holy Spirit whisper in my ear because there was a homeless guy outside. And I sensed the Holy Spirit say, I want you to go talk to him. But I'm already pressed for time. I'm thinking like my coach, I can't be irresponsible. I got to make sure I get to him on time. And so I'm kind of wrestling on the inside. And so of course, man, I did what every pastor would do. I walked outside, I gave him a God bless and I kept it moving. Terrible, terrible. And so I remember getting into my car and I thought, man, how ridiculous was that? I'm going to pick up my coach who's here to train me to help love and serve people and reach more people for Jesus. And he totally would have understood 
but I, I, you know, I couldn't let him down, so I got in the car, and I just remember driving back. I was looking by the Starbucks to see if he was still there, so I was wrecked that night. I was so wrecked that night, I got up the next morning, and I drove, which is probably about, about 30 minutes from me. I drove to that Starbucks just to see if he was there, not there. Every single time that I've gone to that Starbucks, I always stop to see if he was there. And, and I know that God is sovereign and God can use somebody else, but, but I just remember that moment. I felt the weight and the gravity of, oh man, I missed the moment. Like eternity is on the line. Heaven and hell is in the balance. Way to go, pastor. But at the very same time, I also felt like God was increasing my capacity to receive his grace, to understand his grace. A lot of times we understand grace just as undeserved favor, which it is. But, but grace, the Bible speaks also about grace as being a power for living, an influence or a force or a power or an acting of God that works in us to change our capacities for work, suffering, and obedience. And so, so I just sense the, the, the grace of God expanding my capacity, saying, Matt, man, I, I love you. I'm still working in you. I'm still forming you. Um, and I just sense the power now to move into a fresh space. Now, every time I sense the voice of the Holy Spirit, when I'm in that moment, you can ask my wife, I will drop all things to go to that space, to go talk to that person. I could be in a department store, and if I walk out and the Holy Spirit says, go back, I'm like, hey, babe, I, you got a time out. I got to go talk to that person. And so I just watched from that one moment, the grace of God, not only just, just lavish me with an undeserved favor, but also empower me, expand my capacity for future ministry. And so God is so patient with us. He still calls us on mission. He still uses ordinary broken vessels like you and I and says, hey, I still want you to be a part of the story. But, but that patience should also not produce a passivity. Right, It's actually produced the opposite in me. It's produced a perseverance to know that every time I hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit in those moments, I drop everything that I'm doing and I respond. And so when you know the grace of God, what does it do? It, it makes us move way more than it does uh, cause us to be stagnant. If it's stagnation, it's not the grace of God, it's something else. So Jesus said, I want you to go with me and I want you to hold on to my grace. I wanna give you some undeserved favor and I also want to give you some supernatural power to expand your capacity as you go into the world. The second thing is this, is he says, I want you to go with me and I want you to hold on to my authority. I want you to hold on to my authority. Now, now as simple as, as making disciples kind of sounds, right? Hey, identify where somebody's at, help them take a step. What God has called us to is still so much bigger than us. Like Jesus knew in this particular moment that he was commissioning his disciples just like he's commissioning us. And it's something way above our head. It's very simple in nature, but it's still way beyond us. You and I can't change people. Uh, we can't force anybody. Only the spirit of God can do that. Th there's a component to discipleship that you and I, it's, it's just outside of our space. And we have to trust and rely on the spirit of God to meet us in that, that place. So Jesus, knowing that with his disciples, he said, hey, let me, let me point you to my authority. Let me call you away from yourselves and point you to my authority. He says it this way, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Now, as, as, as many of you may know, some of you may not, the theme in Matthew is authority. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's, it's sickness is healed. He has authority over sickness, over blind eyes. He has authority over the lepers. The woman with the issue of blood, she comes up, touches him, power leaves him because it has to move at the authority and the glory of God. All wickedness has got to move. All sickness has got to flee. We see the, his authority over demons. When he shows up on the scene, they flee. Leave me alone. And so, so we, we see this beautiful theme of authority. Jesus, when he shows up, uh, we cross the Sea of Galilee, shows up to the demon-possessed man. The demons responded like, hey, don't cast us into the abyss. Don't, what do you want with us, Jesus? And you guys remember he cast the demon into the pigs. We just see this authority, the authority over sin to both judge it and forgive it. 
And this authority, listen, to give rest to our soul. When the disciples were walking or the disciples were out to sea and, and the storm was raging and, and he speaks to the sea, even creation and the waves, everything has to obey. He has authority over it all. Funny fact, I was, uh, I was in Israel and we were on the Sea of Galilee. It was like a super sacred moment and a jet ski goes by. I'm like, you just messed it up. Messed up the whole moment. But he walks upon creation. Daniel says it this way. Daniel said that he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every tongue and language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He has ultimate authority, ladies and gentlemen, all-encompassing authority. In heaven and on earth, he looks at it all, and he says, it's mine. It's mine. That should radically change the posture of our heart as we go knowing that we go with the one who has all authority. But we don't always feel like that. And neither did the disciples. Like, let's look together. Matthew chapter 14 and 15 says this, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. Now, this is the moment where Jesus is getting ready to feed the 5,000. And they said, man, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, this word... Uh, I, I want you to know this word remote place, it, it means to be deserted. It means desolate. It's a, it's a wasteland. It means to be abandoned. And the disciples are looking like, what are we going to do? There's nothing here for them. And I think sometimes we can show up at work. We can show up at school. We see the wickedness in the world. And when we think about reaching people around us, it just feels impossible. It feels remote. It feels desolate. It feels abandoned. It's like, God, I know you can do anything, but I mean, can you really move in this space? Can you really do it here? Some of us feel like that in our own home. Like, God, I don't know. Some of us feel like that in our own hearts. God, can you really move in this place? Jesus replied to them. He said this. He said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And then they get really sophisticated. They say, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Continues, and it says, bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven. He gave thanks, he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and they gave them to the people. You know this word bring, in the original language in the Greek, it means to get in the habit of constantly bringing. Constantly bringing the impossibility to his hands, the one who has all authority. And so the disciples, they're fumbling through this moment. They're, they're fumbling through their efforts and their power. And then God, listen, Jesus comes on and puts on such a display as he feeds the multitudes. Such a display of power, of glory, almost to remind us this, is that, is that it's never been about persuasion. It's always been about his power. Like it's his authority that gives us our ability to go into the world. It's his strength that is made perfect in our weakness. Are you tracking with me? Like, like he didn't look at the disciples and be like, hey guys, you're so elite. You speak so well. Your strategy, it's on point. Creativity, Stellar. No, he, he said, man, I've given you some gifts. I've given you some talents. Let them pass through my hands. And watch what I can do with your ordinary gifts and talents. I've given you some spiritual gifts. Watch what I can do as you simply step out into the practicality. That's one of the beautiful things about Growth Track is discovering your spiritual gifts. It's, it's, not, it's so much more than a, a personality profile or assessment it's allowing you to, to take and to discover the practical talents of how you're designed and the spiritual gifts that God has given you to simply do what? To show up and let them pass through his hands. God's like, I'm calling you to change the world, but it's not going to be your talent. It's not going to be your skill. It's only when your talent and your skill pass through my hands. It's only when my authority is at work that you will have the ability to go and make disciples. Do you believe that, Lifeline? Do you really believe that? I tell you, when we first started the church, we were broke, like 
like, it was tough. It's still tough. We're in the Bay Area. I, I have dreams of coming to, to Lodi for housing. Um, it's just so expensive, but it's even expensive here. It's everywhere. Nobody gets a pass in Northern California. But I remember, you know, I, I, was, I was taught by Dave Ramsey not to have any debt. Me and Dave have issues. We have problems. I'm like, Dave, you don't live in California. Appreciate your principles. I'm not a hater of Dave Ramsey. I love Dave. But, but I remember we, we first, uh, when we first came and restarted the church, it was wild because I, I, I didn't want a car payment, but we needed a, a larger vehicle because our family was expanding. So I, I, I did what everybody does, did at that time is I went on Craigslist, try to get a good deal. Now, now, mind you, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical of Craigslist, but I, I still went through with it. I found a Honda Pilot with 56,000 miles on it for 11 grand. It's all I had in the bank. I had like 12,000. It's like, babe, I'm going to get us a Honda Pilot. So went to get the Honda Pilot. It was in San Jose. The guy said, meet me at night, which I'm comfortable with. If you know my background, I'm okay with that. I'll meet you at night. Now, it felt a little bit like a drug deal. I got a stack of cash, 11 grand cash. Had to keep telling myself, oh, this is legit. You're okay. This is safe. And so, so I get there and uh, look at the car. Everything looks good. Guy was nice guy. But I just had that check in my spirit. But I'm like, no, man, I'm just probably, it's a lot of money. It's, I'm just going to go for it. Let's, let's just make this thing happen. So I give him the cash. He leaves. And I'm just looking around the car and I look at the pink slip and I noticed there was a smudge on it. I held it up in the light. And the reality was it didn't have 56,000 miles on it. It had 256,000 miles on it. So I thought, this guy just robbed me. First of all, my ego was bruised because I'm from the street. So I was like, hey, I got hustled. This is not supposed to happen to me. But the second thing is I, I got to tell my wife. I got hustled on Craigslist for all of our money. So I remember driving home and you know just that feeling of being violated. I, I get home and I, I tell my wife, she's so gracious and I'm like, thank you, babe. I'm, I'm so sorry. And then I just didn't sleep that night. And, you know, I had one of those days like, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Anybody have those moments? Oh, you guys don't have those moments of Lifeline? All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at all I'm doing. And this, what? So long story short, I want to get rid of the car the next day. I, I tell, tell my wife, I can't even look at this thing. Said, I did what anybody would do. I went to the Honda dealership. I had a friend at the Honda dealership. I said, hey, man, I just got robbed. Can you just get this thing out of my sight? I know I'm going to have a car payment. Dave Ramsey is going to kill me, but give it to me, right? Let's, let's do the deal. So he runs the VIN, and he says, Matt, he says, hey, we, we just had this car. I was like, you did? He's like, yeah, we just got it. We just sold it at the auction. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I know the guy who runs the auction. I was like, you do? And I said, can you call him? He's like, oh, absolutely. So he calls the, the guy, the president of the auction said, oh, I know exactly who this guy is. Comes out, man, he runs cars from California to Mexico. Has this big ring going. And he said, I don't think he's going to want to mess up his, his deal. And so long story short, I get a call. Not from the guy who sold it to me, but from his boss. He said, hey, Mr. Lacey. I said, yes. He said, I think there's been a mistake. I was like, you think? He says, okay, he says, uh, I'm going to give your money back. Meet me at this spot. So at that point, I don't trust anybody. I brought my brother and I brought a gun. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I didn't bring a gun, but I did bring my brother. I did bring my brother. And I told, I told my brother, just in case, we have to lay hands on him. Just in case. <laughs> Pray a blessing over this man. So, so I get there, and it's an older gentleman, and it's like the boss. And he says, sir, I'm, I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. I'm, I'll give you an extra $100 for, your, for interest. I was like, interest? That's right, the extra $100 for interest. But you know how everybody told me when I, when I told them what happened, everybody said, oh, you got, you got scammed on Craigslist? It's gone. But come on, not to the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. I, I remember I was driving on my way to the Honda dealership just worshiping God like, oh, I love you. I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to follow you. I'm giving you my life. And I learned a valuable lesson about his authority. But I also learned about his compassion because that's not the best part of the story. The best part of the story is the, the president of the auction is a backslidden Christian. 
So I called him and I said, thank you so much for doing this. What can I do for you? He said, you're a pastor, right? I said, yeah. He said, would, would you go to Bible study with me? He said, I'm backslidden. I was like, what? I was like, yeah, what time? It's like 6.30 a.m. on Tuesdays. I was like, 6.30? How many of you guys know that was easy? Yes. And God began to renew his relationship with God. What, 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 is, what is so amazing? This is what I told the Lord in that spot. I said, hey, Lord, listen, just, just in case, next time you could just tell me. Just tell me and I'll go. We don't need another Craigslist moment. Just, just tell me you want to reach this guy. But that is the love of God. God is after this man's heart. And was willing to, you know, work out my pain for his glory and for somebody else's good, not just for my good. Like, this is the heart of God into the world. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. The last one is this. Jesus says, I want you to go with me. I want you to hold on to my grace. I want you to hold on to my authority. And lastly is I want you to hold on to my presence. I want you to hold on to my presence. Jesus said it this way. He said, lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, now he wasn't saying, lo, I am with you always. No, it was a lean in. What I'm about to tell you is the most important part of everything I just said. I need you to know that I am with you always, that my grace, my authority, I'm giving you, like, hold on to that, but I'm also giving you myself. Like, we may know that in theory, but when you really grab that and it's no longer a concept, but the witness of, of, of the one who is so merciful and grace, grace-filled toward us gives us and fills us with unmerited favor and his power, expanding our capacity, the one who has all authority, says, I'm not just giving you those things, I'm giving you myself. When you get that, it radically changes your scope. He says, it's my presence that goes before I am with you always. This word with, it, it's actual, it, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum. Meaning it's, it's, it's in the original language when he says, go and make disciples, it really says this, having gone. Meaning it's expected for us to go and make disciples. But, but this word with, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum. It, it's an active with. That as you go, I am with you. A lot of times when we think about the presence of God, we think about spending time with God, we think about getting closer to God. Isn't it interesting how a lot of times we go to a Bible study, prayer, and worship, and all those are good, yes and amen, you should do those things. But a lot of times when we think about getting close to God, we don't think about mission. And he says, dude, I'm with you. And if his presence is with us, and we can be prayerful and mindful, that God, everywhere I step my foot, so does your grace and authority and your presence. Can I just tell you, that'll change the way you interact with your kids. That will change how you interact with your spouse. If you're single, listen, it's not just about finding a spouse, it's about kingdom business. And in that pursuit, man, God is so faithful. It changes our whole lens of how we do life when we understand the beautiful reality of withness, his presence, a lot of his grace and a lot of his authority and his presence. You're like, man, Pastor Matt, that's, that's good. It's so good. And I get it. But what do I do now? I just want to leave you with this tonight. I want to encourage you to, to listen to the cry. You, you guys remember this? Uh, you guys might've did it at the movies to this, but Hacksaw Ridge, I got a couple more slides, so you can just throw on that pad. It's all good. Hacksaw Ridge, there, there was a moment where he's like, God, I can't hear you. The battle's going, bombs are everywhere. It's just dysfunctional chaos and dark. It's like, I can't hear you. And all of a sudden, then he hears cries coming from the rubble. Ah! And you kind of see his ears perk up. And he's like, oh, I hear you. And we see this cry in this movie. I don't recommend it. I can't vouch for the whole movie. It's, it's, it's very violent, all that good stuff. Do your own research. But, but in this moment, you just see him one life at a time. Just give me one more, Lord. Lord, just help me get one more. I, I believe that, listen, in the weeks ahead, the Holy Spirit is gonna stop you dead in your tracks and give you fresh ears. 
gonna give you some fresh eyes but some fresh ears to hear the cry of people around you. You're gonna be walking through places and the Holy Spirit's gonna say, stop, speak to them. Stop, engage them, stop, pray for them. You know how you're walking through the mall sometimes, my wife and I will be walking through and all of a sudden she'll just stop and I don't know if she stopped. I'm like, man. And she's looking at like towels or something. Like, you stopped me for towels. But the Holy Spirit is gonna, there's gonna be moments where he's just gonna stop you dead in your tracks. I, I want you to hear the cry. Now, this is the important thing to understand that in the Hebrew, the word listen and the word obedience is the same. It's the word Shema. That to listen is to obey. To obey is to listen. Meaning this is that there's gonna be moments where the Holy Spirit's saying, I want you to pay attention to this. Stop, I'm gonna give you fresh ears. But I just don't want you to hear the cry. I want you to respond. You guys remember in Exodus when the people were crying out to God, it says that the Lord heard their cry. And what did he do? He didn't, he didn't say, man, I heard your cry. Great cry. Man, you cry. Excellent. You guys hear that cry? Amazing. So good. So good. It's awesome. No, it says he heard their cry and he raised up a deliverer which was Moses. God just doesn't want you to hear the cry, but, but to respond to it. Like, God, I, I hear the cry. It's deep. I hear your heart. I can hear them crying out. And I'm moving in. You know, sometimes, like I said, you're, you're not always going to want to respond to that. But Lifeline, let me, let me close with this story. As I was praying for you, I really believe that God is continuing to do something supernatural in this house. Don't take it for granted as if it's ordinary. God is doing something supernatural here. You're building. Building is hard work. But it's not called to be exhaustive work. When we build in light of his grace, his authority, and his presence, but what I, what I will tell you is, is, is as you go, there's going to be moments where you're just not going to want to respond. Maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you're in a little funk. I'll tell you, um, after Easter, I just got done preaching several different services. This is a couple years ago. And this lady came up to me weeping. And she says, my friend has cancer again for like the fifth time, stage four. And she's just crying. So we pray for her in Jesus' name. And I was just, it was a great day. but I was exhausted. I remember we were going out to Tippinyaki. Anybody ever eat Tippinyaki? Yeah. Going out to Tippinyaki, and it's my favorite. It's expensive, but it's my favorite. And I just remember I was waiting on my brother. <laughs> Did I say my brother? Sorry, bro. Um, I was waiting on my brother. It was, it, was, it was taking some time. And, you know, Tippinyaki, you sit down with other people that aren't from your party. And I just remember thinking, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to eat my steak and go home. Just get my little shrimp and the ginger, go home. And, and so I'm sitting there and the Holy Spirit is prompting me. It's like, Matt, you're going to talk. I'm like, no, I don't want to talk. It's like, Matt, you're going to talk. And this is like the dynamic I'm having with the Holy Spirit in this moment at the table. And there's a family sitting with us. And so finally I'm like, all right, I already learned my lesson on 98th. I'm just going, I'm, I'm, I'm going in on this one. So I didn't say I never fought with God. I just said, I, I, I will end up responding. And I just, I just remember I struck up a conversation with them and found out I was a pastor. And so we're talking and we had some, some mutual friends. And they said, oh, where, where are you a pastor at? And I said, at Fountain Church. And the woman looked at me and she got pale. I was like, uh, is everything Okay. I mean, she just stared at me like something was drastically wrong. And I was like, I'm not going to take an offering. We're good. We're going to eat together. And, and it's like, don't worry, don't panic. And she said, you're, you're the pastor at that church? She says, oh, my goodness, I, I know who you are. You have been praying for me. I'm the woman with cancer. And that moment. Tears were streaming down her husband's face, her kid's face. We stood up in that tippinyaki. We joined hands. We prayed over that fire pit. And I, I learned in that moment, I was like, God, I almost missed the cry. 
I almost missed the cry. She ends up getting saved. God does not heal her of her cancer. She dies. She tells her husband, I want Matt to do my funeral. I preached the gospel to over 700 people, many that responded to the gospel. You never know who's on the other side of that cry. You just never know. So I, I would encourage you tonight, Lifeline Church, it is maybe tonight you're just like, man, I, there's, there's been this gap between what I know and what I live when making disciples. And all I'm saying tonight is just let the Lord fill the gap. Just let the Lord fill the gap. Go not with anxiety and pressure. No, no, no. Go with great rest. One of the main ways that people encountered God was on the mission field. And so listen, as you go into the next weeks, Mother's Day is coming up. That is low-hanging fruit for your church. Like people will say yes just because their mom, what do you want for Mother's Day? Come to church with me. Fine. Like it's, it's low-hanging fruit. Man, go after them. Moms, aunties, Sisters, like, use that leverage with his grace, with his authority, knowing that God is going to meet us in this place. Got at the movies coming up in the summer. Can I just tell you, your pastors are going to, the reason why they maintain health is because they take care of themselves and their family. So many pastors are falling by the wayside right now. I feel like I get a call every other week of a pastor that had a moral failure or somebody, took, somebody bit the dust. And so listen, I think it's a beautiful picture. I got sick. <laughs> this was not really like the sabbatical I wanted, but I got sick uh, a couple years ago. I was out of church for, for almost three and a half weeks. Our church grew. Like, man. And I didn't come back like, you still need me? It was like, no, that's, that's, what, we, that's what we do. We equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so listen, man, take ownership and responsibility over this house. That man, we're called to make disciples. We're called to go out into the space and God is gonna meet us, not just practically, but supernaturally in those moments. There's so many more tip and yaki tables. There's so many people on the other side of car theft. There's so, there, there's a lot of people out there. And so I just wanna encourage you, just let, just let God fill the gap of exhaustion, of weight, of pressure, and see what he'll do. You'll find such a joy in reaching people because you're not carrying that weight. It's his, it's his to bear. Would you stand to your feet? I wanna pray with you. Father, I thank you so much for this church. Thank you for Pastor Elliot, Pastor Tiffany and the team. God, I thank you for the supernatural work that you are doing in this house. Lord, I pray tonight that even some here, I really believe that you fill the gap in your own soul. Can I just tell you God's authority God's grace, God's presence isn't just for the world, it's for you. So if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor Matt, I, I just need God to fill some gaps in my, I could use some of his grace right now. I could use some of his authority right now. I could use a fresh revelation of God's presence in my life right now. Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Yeah, I see your hands. Awesome, so good. Maybe you're here tonight and you just need a fresh yes to go again. Like you, 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 you lost your why. You lost some momentum. You used to believe for supernatural movements of God. You used to believe for revival. It's kind of diminished. It's kind of subtle. And it's not because something's wrong with you. It's just because, man, life is, it just gets full. It gets hectic. You're not really hearing the cries at work anymore. You're not really hearing the cries at school, you're not really hearing the cries at home. You've just kind of been a little bit numb to the cry. And if you're here and you say, I just need some fresh ears tonight. I want to hear the cry again. Would you slip up your hand just so I can see you? The hand is, is more for you than it's for me. I just want to see who you are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Father, I pray over this house tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, you are the God of the gap. Lord, I pray for their personal life, Lord, that your grace would meet them, Lord, unmerited favor, but a power, a supernatural power that would expand their capacity tonight. Lord, I pray for a fresh understanding and revelation of your authority, that they don't just go on their own, God, but with the God who looks at the entire world and all of creation and says, it's mine, now go. 
Lord, I pray there'd be a fresh boldness, a fresh fire as they step into their different spaces, that the cry would be so loud that they can't ignore it, God, that they would find so much joy. It's more blessed to give than receive, your word tells us, that there'd be a new joy in reaching people. There'd be a fresh fervor, a fresh fire. And I pray for a supernatural work and supernatural ears, God, to hear even the silent cry, that they would have words in season prophetic utterances, words of knowledge. God, that our world would never be the same, but we love this great state. Lord, we love this great city of Lodi. And Lord, we, we are contending right now. It's holy ground. This city belongs to you. And this church is a lifeline. So Lord, do it. Do it again. May the latter be greater in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen, let's go.